gives you all of the things that you love about public radio to you every day. 888-376-9692. That's 888-376-WNYC or online. There's a big donate button at WNYC.org. WNYC supporters include Pace University. Pace students learn by doing with resume building internships in nursing, musical theater, environmental law, and ESG. In New York City, Westchester County, and online. Learn more at gogetters.pace.edu. If you believe democracy requires a free press, your station is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Marketplace is supported by Bitwarden. Bitwarden helps enterprises and individuals securely manage passwords from websites to app logins. More at Bitwarden.com. Well, let's see. Something macroeconomic to start, perhaps. Bitcoin, as a little detour, will end with a cup of coffee in Shanghai. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Baird. Employee-owned and independent, Baird offers global financial advice focused solely on clients' needs. More information at BairdDifference.com. And by On Watch by Market Watch, a new podcast covering the financial news everyone is watching and how it's affecting the economy and people's wallets. New episodes each Thursday. And by Indiana University's Kelly School of Business, developing tomorrow's business leaders through the nationally ranked Kelly Direct Online MBA. More at iu.edu slash online MBA. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Rizdal. It is Friday today. This one is the 1st of March. Good as always to have you along, everybody. First Friday of the month, and you know what that means, right? means we get an extra 30 seconds to talk about the week that was. It's not my rule. The producers get to decide. Gina Smilek is at the New York Times. Sadiq Reddy is at Politico. Hey, you two. Hey, Kai. Hey, Kai. Gina, let me start with you, uh, if I could. And I want to talk about uh, the inflation measure that came out this week, the um, uh, the PCE measure that the Fed likes, as we all know. If you listen to this program, it's the Fed's favorite measure. Here's what I want you to talk about. I want you to talk core PCE, what it is and why it especially matters. Right. So core PCE is this sort of underlying inflation gauge that is pretty slow moving. And that is why it is basically the Fed's favorite number. It takes out food and it takes out gas and it basically tracks, you know, a, a basket of things that people buy in the economy. Um, and so the Fed watches this number very closely. It comes out every month a little bit after the consumer price index numbers, which people might be a little bit more familiar with because mm-hmm. they tend to get more headlines because they come out sooner. Um, and so the Fed watches this number really closely and it has been, and it continued to consistently sort of trending. It has been consistently trending down over the months. Um, so that is very good news on an annual basis. Unfortunately, on a monthly basis, we saw a little bit of an increase this time. And so I think that the reason that we care so much about that monthly increase is it suggests that what is sort of like happening in the most recent period is that inflation might be not cooling down quite as much as we previously expected, may even be warming back up a little bit. And so I think that's really a trend to watch. It's going to be something that gives Fed officials some pause. It it kind of complicates this nice story they have been telling about this real steady, consistent slowdown in inflation. Sudeep, talk to me about that steady, consistent slowdown. It has been, as we've said on this program, Gina said in the piece, the, the descent of inflation has been bumpy and it is going to be bumpy. How are we going to know whether it's bumpy or bumpy on the way down or stuck where it is bumpy, if that makes any sense? I think one reason why this is confusing right now is because the economy is not going into the toilet which is a good thing, obviously, <laughs> that, is, that, is that thing, if, yes. if, the, if the economy were falling apart, which a lot of people have predicted over the last two years as the Fed raised interest rates, the economy would fall apart, uh, demand would fall across the, the economy, inflation would drop even further, and the, the end of that parabola would look pretty pretty clear. And instead, the economy is actually, obviously, the job market is, is uh, surprisingly robust and strong. There are things that are holding up reasonably well, which means that things are going to get bumpy right now. Because if demand for labor is uh, is still high, if, if the, the lower end of the labor market is tight, uh, that means services inflation is going to be higher. A lot of things are going to, mm-hmm. there's going to be price pressures sticking in there. 
And so that means that getting it further down is not good. That that last bit is going to be harder than it than people would have thought. But it's in the context of an economy that's holding up reasonably well. Gina, it, is it your sense based on your reporting that the Fed is concerned about the bumpiness or they're like, yeah, no, we knew this was coming? You know, I think that they knew that it was likely not going to be a completely consistent cool down in inflation. Like they knew that there were bumps possible. I think that we had had so many months of really good data that there had been some optimism that actually we might sort of be past the point of bumps. That, you know, mm-hmm. like we, yeah, we might yeah. be reaching this perfect soft landing that happened totally comfortably and we didn't have to worry about the bumpiness. And I think that this really sort of dispels that notion and makes it much less likely that we're just going to have a perfect, easy cool down. And so I think, you know, I think they, they aren't 100 percent caught off guard here, but I, yeah. I think they're, they're probably still pretty unhappy about it. Mm. Uh, Sudeep, you mentioned uh, the economy doing pretty well, not being in the toilet. And point of fact, we learned this week the economy's in the fourth quarter of last year on an annualized basis, growing at uh, an annual rate of 3.2%, which is quite nice. Thank you very much. It was a touchdown from earlier predictions. Here's my question. Look around the rest of the planet. The U.S. is the developed economy doing the best by miles. How come we're not lifting all the other boats, you know? That's a, a good question. We are still obviously a huge anchor of the global economy and what we buy does drive what what's happening in a lot of other places. Everyone seems to have a different set of problems. They're, we're all in a different place. Uh, so it's not the the big synchronized uh, effect that you mm-hmm. see coming out of recessions. Um, you could say this is late stage uh, economic <laughs> behavior on the global economy. You, uh, th- that's certainly what you would, you would assume when you see what's happening in Europe and what's happening uh, in, in China. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there are things that are actually going okay in a lot of other places. There's a reason why, uh, you know, Japan is seeing a, a return of a record stock market after decades. Yep. Uh, there, there are places that, that look a little uplifting. And I think this is going to take years to untangle what's happened in the post-COVID economy. But uh, the 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 entanglement of all of these economies, the separations that we've been forming to not be as reliant on supply chains, not be as reliant on each other, those may be playing some part in this. We don't we don't know yet. It's way too early to to make that assessment, but it may be a factor in why we're all operating on slightly different speeds uh, than we might have been at different at other points in the last two decades. Yeah, Sudeep, sorry, just sticking with you real quick. What what's your what's your concern level over the politics of this economy right now? You know, there was, uh, you know, we had we had economic data about uh, consumer sentiment. People are it wasn't as strong. It, it dipped a little bit. I think people still feel a little bit uncertain. But there there are two things going on right now when consumer sentiment might dip a little bit. But also today we, we saw the headlines that oil has hit $80 mm-hmm. a barrel first time since November. That is the kind of thing that really weighs on people, particularly as the spring and summer approaches and shapes our own perceptions, even if it's an outsized figure and gases and everything, but it does play into all of the dynamics about economic growth, obviously about inflation. And I think that's a big factor to watch about uh, how people feel in the coming months, uh, as long as the job market holds up. Gina, oil makes me uh, just think of the word exogenous shocks, right? As the Fed watches this and as consumers watch what's going on, there's a lot happening that maybe we're not entirely in control of. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot that's happening that we're not in control of. I think that exogenous shocks, like sort of the stuff coming from the outside, that matters a lot when you're the Fed thinking about policy and thinking about, like, can we control this inflation? It's a lot less relevant when you're talking about this from a political point of view. You know, like you can tell people, oh, we can't do much about gas and groceries. But at the end of the day, people buy gas and groceries. And so when gas and groceries are becoming a lot more expensive, they feel a lot worse about the world. And so I I think that that's sort of the the sort of difficulty with this inflationary moment is it, it can be much more politically damaging. Yeah, this inflationary moment. Gina Smilek, The New York Times, and Sadiq Reddy at Politico on a Friday afternoon. Thanks, you two. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Let's do the numbers. Dow Industrials added 90 points today, nine zero points, two tenths percent, 39,087. The NASDAQ gained 183 points, one and a tenth percent, finished at 16,274. The S&P 500 up 40 points, about eight tenths percent, 51 and 37. For the five days gone by, the Dow was down about a tenth percent. The Nasdaq climbed one and seven tenths percent. S&P 500 added almost one percent. Now about those regional banks. 
Troubles continue for the regional lender New York Community Bank. We told you a bit about this. This week, it admitted, and this is a quote, material weaknesses in how it gauges the riskiness of loans. That is a very not good thing for a bank. The bank says it's stockpiling cash and has brought in a new CEO. NYCB shares plummeted 25.9% today. Bond prices went up. Yield on the 10-year T-note down 4.18% on this Friday. You're listening to Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Progressive Insurance. On the road and at home, customers can simplify their insurance needs and protect what's important by bundling home and auto with Progressive Insurance. Learn more about Progressive and bundling at Progressive.com. And by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to raising awareness and accelerating action on America's fiscal challenges to build a brighter economic future for the next generation. Learn more at pgpf.org. And by Raymond James, tailored wealth management, banking, and capital markets solutions for clients' unique needs. Disclosures at RaymondJames.com. You're listening to WNYC. It's Marketplace. All Things Considered coming up at 7 o'clock. Both of those programs and everything else you hear on this radio station is brought to you by listener support. That means voluntary monetary contributions to keep this programming coming to you every single day of the week. That is why during this winter pledge drive, we are imploring you to join other listeners who contribute and contribute what you can. Whatever whatever you can find in your wallet works for us. When we add it all up, it's the largest source of our funding. So we are calling you to contribute. Keep WMIC on the air. Keep us strong into this election year. 888-376-9692 or WMIC.org. Sean, the exciting part right now is that we have an anonymous donor who is matching every dollar given for the next mm, just under 20 minutes. Mm matching every dollar for dollar here. So your money, when you contribute to this public radio station, goes twice as far. So if you're giving $5, let's say you're coming in on $5 Friday. If $5 works in your budget, fantastic. Mm -hmm. We're so glad to have you because guess what? Right now, that becomes $10. 888-376-9692 is the way to do it or to go click on that uh, big Donate button at WNYC.org. While you're there, you can look over all the gifts. If you're like, you know what, the, the socks that I'm going to get with my $5, I want to look at some of the other gifts and mm-hmm. see what's out there as well. And hey, perfect place to do it. WNYC.org. Make your donation. Look at the gifts. Moira in the Bronx is getting socks and the Bagu bag. See, we have tote bags. It's yeah. public radio. Mm-hmm. 888-376-9692. WNYC.org. The important thing is... Just under 20 minutes here for your contribution to go twice as far, to work twice as hard toward the programming you hear. 888-376-9692 or WNYC.org. One of our newest members said this about making the decision to join WNYC. I commute at least an hour each way to work. Having you to listen to is wonderful. Whether your commute is an hour or five minutes, WNYC makes it easy for you to listen, on air, online, or with our new app. Are you helping to support WNYC? Maybe it's time to become a member. We make that easy, too. Here's how to do it. Call 888-376-9692. You can go online, too, to WNYC.org. New members always welcome. I love expanding the size of the pool because, again, when we add all of it up, uh, it is the largest source of funding here at WNYC. So if you're new to the whole thing, please join us. As Tiffany was saying, you know, if you're thinking of of, 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 a, of a starter level way to get involved here, consider becoming a sustaining member at a level of $5 a month. That's a great um, way to start being involved here at WNYC, and we'll be happy to send you the socks. Think, too, uh, when we're talking about new members, think about being a new member of the producer circle. If you've been here for a while and you know what pledge drives are about and you are a sustaining member, consider maybe upping that contribution. Join the producer circle here. That is a contribution level of $100 a month or $1,200 a year. And you get uh, invites to cool WNYC events. You see some behind the scenes uh, things, take a tour of the station, meet some of the hosts like Tiffany and myself. Um, and again, right now in this moment, we are under that matching period. So it goes twice as far. So if you're looking to make a big
big impact and saying, you know what, I'm going to make a statement with the money that I have available to me. I'm going to contribute to WNYC, join the producer circle at a level of $100 a month, knowing that right now, if I make that contribution right now, it'll be $200 a month. Call 888-376-9692 or go online to WNYC.org. Just under 15 minutes left to go in this match we have. An anonymous donor giving us $1 for every dollar pledged. 888-376-9692-WNYC.org. When we say pledged, basically it's pledging a bit of your financial support to make sure that the station you value can continue in the way that you're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. All of this great programming that comes to you, it's because of donors, listeners just like you. Join the members of WNYC.org, 888-376-9692. Your contribution going twice as far right now. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdal. The labor market's real strong. Wages are up. But housing is still really expensive. And on that point, housing affordability here is Exhibit 1. The real estate firm Zillow says that since January of 2020, the mortgage payment, monthly, that is, on a typical home in this economy, has nearly doubled, up 96% to be precise, that is, in just four years. A typical buyer is now going to pay nearly $2,200 a month. Let me frame that a different way. Home ownership now costs more than the 30% of median household income once thought to equate to affordable housing in this economy. And with the 30-year fixed, bouncing right around 7% now, there is not a whole lot of light at the end of that particular tunnel, as Marketplace's Mitchell Hartman reports. With prices rising by leaps and bounds, it's been a good time to sell a home, not so great to try and buy, says Orfe Divangi, senior economist at Zillow. After the surge in home buying demand and mobility during the pandemic and the doubling of mortgage rates, Home shoppers now need to earn $106,000 to afford the median home in the United States. Back in 2020, the salary needed to afford the median monthly mortgage payment was just $59,000. Real estate broker Israel Hill has seen the affordability crunch in Portland, Oregon. There's nowhere to go, right? I mean, the prices aren't dropping because there's no inventory. With mortgage rates around 